Hey guys, uh, good evening, uh, students and alumni alike. Before I pass this uh, opportunity to uh, Mr. Ian Ong, uh, the alumni manager, just, I just want to run through quickly you know, a couple of uh, simple reminders. Yeah. All right. So during the presentation, mm -hmm. keep on your uh, camera so that the speaker can look at you and we can look at you too. Okay. And then if you have any questions, you know, uh, you can ask right at the end. Okay. Uh, during the Q and A. Um, if you are afraid that you might forget it, right? If you guys are afraid that you guys might forget it, you can type it in and then I, I'll just keep, take note of it and then I can ask the speaker at the end, okay? All right, so thank you in advance for your cooperation. Uh, I'm gonna pass the, the floor now to Mr. Ian Ong. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Good evening, everyone. If you do not know me, my name is Ian Ong and I am the Alumni Relations Manager for ESSEC Asia Pacific. We are very pleased to welcome our ESSEC alumnus, Leo, we will be speaking on the topic, e-commerce and Q-commerce. How has the business landscape been redefined for the luxury and wine and spirits industries? Without further ado, I shall now pass the mic over to Leo for his presentation. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Jan. Thank you everyone to, um, to be here tonight and thank you, Essek, for, um, for letting me having the opportunity to uh, actually chat a little bit about what I'm doing here at Terrific One for Singapore and uh, what's going on. So um, just like, yeah, if there's any sound issue, any, um, any other kind of problem, uh, don't hesitate. So uh, I know Zoom meetings are definitely not the best way to, um, to have an interactive chat. So uh, probably the worst actually. So I would, I would love to, uh, to have every one of you like just interrupt me at any time uh, if you wanna, um, if you have questions or if you think like there's something you wanna say. Uh, but so apparently just, uh, just notify um, Will or Jan on the chat, or just keep your question for later. Uh, I'll try to be um, as fast as possible in the presentation, and uh, and then we can just like have a casual chat about uh, basically uh, the spirits and the luxury industry. So that's it. Um, so I'm Leo. I've been um, I'm from an internet park, uh, Cursus, and then a little of Essex, and then I joined Remy Quattro three years ago now um, at Hong Kong. Uh, in Hong Kong, sorry, to uh, develop the uh, e-commerce strategy there and uh, basically work on uh, digital marketing. So I did Hong Kong and then I joined Singapore uh, to basically keep this uh, work ongoing. So I'm the business developer, which means that basically I'm um, finding business for uh, Remy Quattro to grow in e-commerce. And as you may suspect, um, within the last few months, it has been uh, quite a bit of a challenge and quite a bit of a growth to, uh, to handle. So just uh, for those who don't know, Remy Quattro is a French group. It's the third large, largest French group when it comes to um, uh, spirits, uh, wines and spirits, which uh, means that basically we're competing directly with two other groups that you might know very well, which are Pernod Ricard and LVMH under their MH section. Um, Remy Quattro's strategy is um, basically to have a luxury portfolio and a very high-end portfolio. So we we'll always try to promulize all our products uh, even if it comes to have small production and, uh, and uh, smaller volumes of sales, basically. Um, during COVID, um, this company actually did very well for itself, but just not in Southeast Asia Pacific. So um, in China and in the United States, which are the two major markets for Remy Quattro, we uh, actually had a major growth and uh, we just changed CEO something like six months ago. And uh, basically the stock option went uh, up as crazy uh, during the COVID crisis due to a pretty good management, once again, not in CIAP. When it comes to CIAP, uh, we faced quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of challenges. Uh, first of all, of course, there was a couple of lockdowns there. And um, also to a certain extent, uh, the spending and purchasing power of, uh, of some people in the country of Southeast Asia Pacific is not the same as the one you would have in the United States or uh, in uh, China, or even in Europe and the uh, Middle East. So at the end, when you're a luxury company and a premium company, it can, uh, it can affect uh, quite a bit. So in Remy, uh, in Remy Quattro, sorry, in Singapore and in Malaysia and a couple of other markets, um, Remy Quattro is actually teaming up with another group, which is called Campari Group, which uh, you might know very well for all Aperture Streets, Campari, Wild Turkey, Sky Vodka. So, Basically, two very, very different um, uh, approach that we have as a company, but we try to team up in uh, something that we call in um, the FNB, so food and beverage industry, the on trade. So, the on trade is basically the bars, the restaurants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
So because we have very complementary portfolio of products, we can actually offer a um, very good deal and, um, and just have a very uh, relevant offer to all our partners for Andre. When it comes to Remy Quattro, I think that um, in ESSEC, I remember my marketing classes quite well. And um, you will always learn about having a diversified portfolio and a diversified um, uh, pool of clients is very good. So um, at Remy Quattro, we do exactly the opposite. So we have one very strong brand, which is Remy Martin, basically, but you might see here, Remy Martin is approximately 80% of Remy Quattro income. And Remy Martin, so it's a cognac, is sold uh, basically almost um, in only two markets, the United States, uh, through the rap and the uh, Afro-American community, because it was a way for the Afro-American, uh, like uh, 100 years ago, to differentiate themselves from um, the white community, which was uh, working whiskey, uh, sorry, drinking whiskey. And in China, uh, where we have massive volumes, uh, basically, uh, mainly in KTV and Thai disco. So only one brand and only two markets and only very specific uh, market issues. So that's basically the opposite of a good diversification strategy. So we're working on it, obviously. So I'm just going to um, uh, go with you through like very generic data on um, uh, e-commerce, F&B, and a bit of luxury um, to start. And then we'll move forward in more interesting topics. But I think it's quite kind of important. I'm pretty sure you all know uh, quite a bit of it, but anyways. So on the upper uh, left figure here, you can see the global GDP worldwide uh, and its evolution through the quarters in 2020. So we've been through like a minus 13% in quarter two and 7% in quarter three. So we're basically the world is uh, recovering of the crisis, but still uh, the, the, the amount of money spent all around the world just, just um, down, you can see a quick FNB snapshot. So FNB, once again, food and beverage, that's uh, uh, where uh, the, um, basically Remy Quattro is uh, working in. So you can see that during, that's since the beginning of the year. Since the beginning of the year in the United States, they lost approximately $250 billion. Uh, this is the estimate, so that's a minus 30 person. Very similar in, Euro, uh, in uh, the European Union with a minus 30 person. Singapore did very well for itself, especially by allowing a lot of restaurants to remain open with only minus 12 person. In China, uh, we, well, they say seven person, we never really know, but uh, apparently everything's like reopening right now. So it should be, um, it should be pretty true. Um, now just completely different on the upper right, you can see basically the um, uh, e-commerce, um, basically the e-commerce value all around the world. So e-commerce has been in, uh, well, is forecasted because 2020 obviously is not over, but like it's forecasted to be in 2020, a four trillion um, industry, uh, US dollar industry, which is a growth of 15% versus, versus last year. So you would think that e-commerce maybe just um, uh, became like uh, the main um, uh, retailing channel, uh, actually not so much because um, the forecasted growth in 2019 to 2020 was more than 20 percent, and then we're finally uh, at only 15 percent. This is mainly due to the Chinese and the Indian market. The Chinese market, which is already very developed when it comes to e-commerce, just went down a little bit during the crisis, whereas the Indian market is just basically a problem of a basic revenue spend and revenue allocation. Um, just everything went down in India in 2020. So. Still in data, like this is the um, before COVID uh, figure. So um, on the left, you have the on trade. Here you have the off trade. The off trade is basically all your retail sources. So it can be liquor stores, it can be uh, cold storage, it can be NTUC fair price. It's also all the boutiques for the luxury and, uh, and uh, the wine industry. Then you have the e commerce, which is like just a very small part of it, and um, something that was going up very, very much before uh, the COVID crisis, that was the travel retail. So uh, that's basically he, 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 like the main part of the whole f &B competitive landscape. So meaning us, uh, Perno Ricard, uh, MHD, you have like Beam Century, for those who know Bacaria, et cetera, et cetera. It's mainly focused on the on-trade parts. Then you have a little bit in uh, off-trade, but the major growth are on the two little ones, which are basically travel retail, which is also a big deal for the uh, luxury industry. And, um, the off trade. Obviously, after COVID, this is more of a figure. So the on trade closed down all around the world. The off trade is um, 
actually did very well for itself and is now a bigger part, a bigger share of the channel sales for uh, the luxury and fashion in Germany. And e-commerce, of course, boomed uh, where I'm currently in South Africa. So the specs uh, is like doing zero right now. There's nothing happening. So in um, this is just a couple of figures I, I, I wanted you to see. So all these uh, data, like for those who are interested, um, the fact of being in Singapore is, um, is very good before, because Singapore is actually um, keeping a lot of data and uh, taking a lot of data and making them public. So I think you just want like um, the Singapore data um, uh, institutional line, you can have pretty much everything you need. Uh, I just wanted you to see like the on-trade versus off-trade versus the off-trade for the luxury how it went down during COVID. So between February and July here, uh, the on-trade here went down to 53%. The off-trade for F&D went down to 60%. And for luxury, we almost went down to 100%. So what happened for us? Basically, um, we're an on-trade based company. Everything we do on the domestic market of Singapore, on the domestic market of France, of China, etc., etc., is for the consumer to enjoy the drink. We don't really sell bottles. That's not our purpose. We sell cocktails, we sell experience, we sell something else. So what do we do? Basically, in Singapore, you um, have a couple of scenarios. There's a couple of venues that, uh, so bars, restaurants, uh, even KTV, but so the COVID crisis coming very, very early. So on the left here, you have, for example, something that was um, released by a, a group of um, FND called Empire Eats very early during the COVID crisis in January. They decided to do cocktail delivery. And aside this cocktail delivery, as you can see, there's like a yoga mat. So I think they just wanted to... Uh, like get people the possibility to do yoga and meditation and bed get drunk, which is uh, probably a very good thing. And these sort of groups, these sorts of venues actually saw their income double, triple, quadruple during the COVID crisis. Because when you think about it, even if you have several venues, you have a limited amount, uh, amount of seats. So if you start basically being online and being the first mover online, uh, your consumer pool is going to get crazy. So for this kind of venue, but uh, where the early new movers actually were doing extremely well during COVID and they're doing much better than if the COVID didn't happen. Then you have like uh, other places like, um, um, so this is a bar called uh, Casa Poncho. Uh, actually it's uh, managed by two people from ESEP. So uh, if you want to go there, you probably can't anymore because they closed, but uh, if you wanted to go there, like many, a lot of students know it, they decided to do bottle cocktails. Uh, which was also very interesting at a very good price. On the right here, you have uh, a couple of initiatives that all the industry has been doing. So it's called Livestream, like you've all seen this on uh, Facebook, Instagram, but also a lot uh, now on Lazada, Shopee, a couple of other e-commerce platforms. So basically we bring people together. Since they can't meet, we just make them meet online and same cocktail delivery, a bit of sales, a bit of activation, a bit of support. Uh, and like, yeah, there's, there's a couple of other things. I'm not going to extend too much here, but like the best 50 uh, bars, which is something very important in the industry of the, of the food and beverage went online, etc. So now still a bit of data. Uh, I think we're almost done with it. Just wanted to compare. So that's still Singapore data. Just wanted to compare two channels uh, for you to, to see that uh, e-commerce and F&B just grow, but not as much as uh, you could have expected. So in January here, uh, the share of e-commerce in retail for all the F&B was approximately of 8%. We went up to approximately 12% um, in August. So it's a growth for sure, but it's not a major growth. Now take the electronic industry. So this is an essential industry, right? Take the electronic industry. They went uh, from 25, 26% uh, in Singapore in January up to a 94% year in May at the middle of lockdown and now down to a steady 50%. So what happened, obviously electronic is not essential in the industry. So obviously the only way that you could, you know, get a new iPhone, for example, was to go online. Uh, however, this is a very impressive growth and the difference between F&B online and the electronics, which is, which has been historically like a, a very, very big uh, um, uh, e-commerce uh, actor is huge. So, uh, yeah, now when you think about like um, uh, the alcohol uh, industry, which is part of the F&B, but not 
all the FMB, we actually went up to like something like 25% of e-commerce share in retail. So it's still very strong. I think that's uh, pretty much it for um, the data. Uh, if you have any questions, once again, like just uh, just uh, let uh, Will and Jan know in the chat and uh, we'll move forward. So what have been basically the global challenges uh, for us in, um, in 2020? that obviously people are less drinking. So I'm just going to uh, talk about it and like give you a, a small example of the different products that we have. So when you think of alcohol, uh, you have to think about like a, an extremely tax sensitive product. So the question is like, uh, is the tax discrepancy between the country a problem? Well, absolutely. Think about it. In the United States, if you purchase a bottle of strong alcohol, you're going to have to pay like $2.14 USD per bottle, then you have like a state tax, that's, which is from five to 150 percent, that's completely stupid. So five percent, I think is, uh, I don't know, I think it's California and 150 is like in Alaska, something like that. Um, in France, you have a tax that is equal to $28 uh, per pure alcohol liter. So if you take France, Switzerland here and um, Singapore, they are, their taxation of alcohol is based on um, the, the amount of alcohol you have in the bottle. So if you think that alcohol in Singapore is expensive, it's just because you drink very cheap booze. If you purchase a very expensive whiskey, a very expensive cognac, actually this um, fixed tax is going to be, this fixed duty is going to be not much of an issue because it's fixed. So if you purchase like a $1,000 whiskey, you will only have, for example, $30 uh, of taxes uh, when it comes to the alcohol taxes. However, if you take markets like China, like India, like the UK, you're going to have a duty that is going to be ad valorem based. So in the UK, a whiskey that costs you $1,000, you're going to take 20% tax on it. Whereas in Singapore, you are only going to be taking basically $65 multiply the amount of ABV you have in the bottle, so approximately $30. So that's the big difference that we have and the big challenge we have to face because when we're building our pricing, our pricing for alcohol, what do we want to do? We want all the markets to basically have the same selling price to the consumer. We want our whiskey, but you can find in Singapore at $1,000. We want you to be able to find it in the UK at $1,000. We want you to be able to find it in the US at $1,000, which means that our duty-free price is going to be very different. So now, why is this an issue? Because in every country, basically, um, the state decided to um, implement what is called bonded warehouses. So you can store your alcohol without paying the duty. Most of the country, this is very, very controlled when you control the store, for example, yourself in a bonded warehouse. It needs to be like a certified business and a registered business. In some countries, like Switzerland, like the United Kingdom, and to some extent Singapore, you can actually um, store your product much easier if you know how to do it. So, for example, if you have, uh, let's say, 10 bottles of this whiskey of $1,000, you can store it basically at the $1,000 price minus the duty. So keep this in mind. The other thing that happened during COVID, so this is really COVID related, is basically the, the exchange rate. So as you know, the United States, uh, the USD went um, down as crazy. This might be solved tonight, but maybe not fully, it really depends uh, what's, uh, what you think about uh, the US election, but anyways. Uh, so you can see that the US uh, the USD went down, went down, went down versus the Chinese yuan, went down versus the Swiss franc, uh, went basically steady versus the Singapore dollar, it's really because the Singapore dollar is, is also indexed, indexed um, to the British pound, and British pound obviously suffered Brexit. And there is one market that went even more down when it comes to its currency than the United States, it's India, the Indian rupee. So now, What's the worst case scenario here? Let's say you're an Indian-based company trading in So This is the exchange rate from Bloomberg between the uh, Swiss franc and uh, the um, Indian rupee. So let's say you're an Indian-based company trading in What you do here is to buy in India, in rupees, bonded stock, so you don't have to pay taxes on it. 
and you want to store them in a country where basically uh, Rwandan legislation is not um, so um, regarding. So for example, Switzerland or Singapore or the United Kingdom. Then you can resell at a low tax market when your uh, exchange rate is very positive and then you're just going to uh, get rich. If you accumulate the exchange rate and the taxation rate, then you have a low cost price and you can resell at a very high selling price. So what is this a problem for us? We got a product that is a very good example uh, at uh, Rennes Macro. This product is called WeTrez. WeTrez is this kind of cognac that you have here. It's like a very fancy bottle, very expensive cognac, approximately $3,000 USD retail price. And we want this price to be the same in every country. So once again, let's say you're an Indian uh, liquid company. Uh, sorry, so, so what you want to do is purchase in India in a bonded uh, warehouse. So you don't have to pay these taxes because the price of the in India is going to be much lower than in every other country because the, the tax rate, the duty rate is very high. So you purchase in duty free, you store in duty free, and then you resell to a low tax market, for example, Switzerland at a very high price. What happens here is that for we trust you have three main channels. The first one is going to be the private clients. So it's basically us being in touch with our clients and doing sales. The second one is going to be on trade. So on trade is going to have Michelin star restaurants, uh, it's going to have Chinese five star restaurants, and also we can pay so much the tax of KTV. And uh, the other one is going to be uh, travel retail. So as you know, on trade and travel retail so very much during the COVID crisis, what happened here, people need to uh, get liquidity, they need to have cash. So they do loss sales and they do parallel imports. So parallel import is basically exactly what we've been talking about. So it's uh, purchasing on a low tax market, on, sorry, uh, in duty free and resell to a low tax market uh, by using the exchange rate to make more money. So at the end of the day, it impacts our price consistency, it impacts the perceived value and it will impact the private client, which will all come back to us and say, hey, guys, uh, why are you selling product more expensive? It's exactly the same. Uh, we don't trust you anymore, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just hurting the brand very badly. So the solution we have here is to find valorization and make them understand that you know, uh, we're doing a lot of things for them. So tasting, gifting, et cetera, et cetera. We need to do marketing. We need to release new products that are going to be different in other new markets at a better price uh, or you know, do a bit of lobbying with uh, institutions to make sure that this doesn't happen. However, uh, during COVID, all this happened very quickly. And then you, if you look for your trades on the internet, and I invite you to do this, you will see that there's like very stupidly low prices because of this issue. So that was for an example, basically, of, what, uh, of what's happening uh, with the tax rates and the, uh, and the, um, uh, the change rate. Uh, so now if you think about e-commerce as our consumer pool, as a company, like we had to adapt at, uh, to new behaviors and to new business models that have been emerging. So many people say that we did in six months, a jump of five years ahead when it comes to um, e-commerce development and digital development. So we saw new business models and new supply chain models that uh, happen. I'm going to... Uh, this slide uh, to talk a little bit about our uh, perception of, um, of e-commerce and our perception of time. So basically e-commerce, what it does, um, it reduces consumption time and it liberates free time. So um, the consumption time, which is something painful for everyone, you don't want to be out, you don't want to uh, uh, get your stuff from cold storage, from the airport, etc. It's kind of a boring uh, experience. E-commerce is going to um, helps you to uh, liberate this time to, to make it um, easier to shop. So hypermodern individual, hypermodern individual are basically us people using uh, um, smartphone people like from the millennial generation or X or Y or even older. So hypermodern individuals are optimizing their time as much as possible to liberate leisure time. Uh, that's due to diversification, increase of possible activities. So good question is, isn't the main value of e-commerce actually the time it gives back versus like the price it gives? So there is an opinion way study uh, on French shoppers, so it's only in French shoppers, uh, that shows that actually shopping online is made 
predominantly during empty times, meaning uh, transport, public transportation, uh, waiting times, and also at work. Apparently, it's, it's empty time for, for a lot of French uh, people. So e-commerce is not just a new sales channel. It's like re really redimensioning uh, our ways of consuming by removing dependability from the shopping experience. So it's one of many parts of what is called the uh, hypermodern hypermodernity syndrome. Sorry, I have a bit of pain to say this word. Um, because people basically are, are looking for a full flow experience. Full flow experience means uh, you can check uh, online a bit like there's a couple of, um, of um, offers I'm talking about it. The full flow experience means that uh, we want to experience everything as much as we can. We don't want anything to be boring. So the e-commerce by liberating time is actually helping us to have this full flow experience. However, there's also an issue because uh, the fact that us not having any boredom, not being bored anytime, and having always this full flow experience is also uh, apparently making us less creative and less So anyways, what e-commerce do? Basically, just have a look at the um, uh, general equilibrium theory in uh, neoclassicism. When you, take, when you think about general economy, all the postulates that you have to take when you, when you talk about like general equilibrium theory are contested. Um, the postulates are you need uh, the economical agent to, uh, you need an atomicity of the economical agents in general economies that's contested. Transparent information, that's obviously contested. Free circulation of capital in the world, yeah, as long as you have taxes and you just saw it before, it's also contested. Free entry and exit of the market, same contested. And same for homogeneity of good. When you speak of uh, e-commerce, this is um, basically much closer to be true than it was with um, a general economy because the atomicity of economical agent is more truer because you can just basically be online, uh, anyone can be online, but transparent information is also uh, much bigger because you can just uh, have only all the information you want on the internet. Uh, same for free circulation of capital and work, same for free market entry and exit, etc. Et However, this is uh, also There's also a down to this. This is the growth, uh, the growth of complexity. So yes, you have everything you need online. Yes, you can find any information you need online. However, finding any information is becoming increasingly complex because everyone, every company knows how to influence people. And uh, you need to find an information by basically going for the channel you know. And the channel you know are most of the time going to be your friends and through your friends, especially during COVID period, we're well, talking about social media. So handling the information and its visibility online is really the best way for the company and for the corporation to kind of manipulate the shoppers. And that's why uh, 10 years ago, we created what we call today the influencers. That's people that are going to be basically within your sphere and influence and going to convince you to have the same kind of behavior when it comes to consumption. So, Knowing all this, how do we replace the shopping experience if we are like, for example, a wine spirits company like us or luxury company? Think about it if you're, sorry, I'm just going to have a bit of cold. Not getting dry. So you need more experience when it comes to, um, to e-commerce because if you're going to, um, to a shopping center, to a mall, if you're going to uh, stores, basically you have the possibility to touch, the possibility to smell, and when it comes to the FNB, also the possibility most of the time to taste. So now we know we have a pure and perfect information issue or not issue uh, uh, on internet because you can know pretty much everything. Uh, you have uh, a problem with the time location and you need to know exactly what, uh, where you want to spend your time. This means that you have four kind of business models that are going to uh, be created. The first one is going to be based on the experience. The second one is going to be based on the supply chain excellence. And the third one is going to be based on speed. There is also one that is based on price, but that's uh, not so relevant. So, uh, when you think about experience, basically uh, there's something that has been created a long time ago to compete with Amazon, which is uh, the 
marketplace model, which has been not created, but uh, basically uh, processed by a Chinese company called Alibaba, that you all know, or JD.com. In uh, Alibaba, in JD, in Shopee, in Zara, what you will have is experience. You will have diversity, an infinity of products through an exhaustive portfolio. You will have a very big price competition because uh, basically all the shoppers are free to get onto the market. However, you're going to like delivery quality and sorry, delivery and, uh, and um, quality. Out of these Lazada and Shopee uh, and Alibaba and a lot of others, according to the country uh, marketplace models, you also have the social commerce. The social commerce is basically the way to shop on uh, social media, it's like Facebook marketplace, for example. So what you have to think um, is that we spend on average, and that's not just uh, the young generation, that's like literally everyone, on average, 135 minutes on social media. So this is a very, very good window for every brand to uh, be exposed. The second model is going to be more of an e-retailer model. This model is uh, massive by Amazon. Amazon, they have to some extent a couple of marketplace uh, uh, possibilities, but what they do mainly is that they store your product. So they have um, amazingly Houses and they will basically deliver to you uh, with a supply chain excellency level of service. So level of service, quality of the product and delivery, however, the lack of diversity when it comes to crime now. And also sometimes when it like uh, when it comes to uh, to, to Amazon.com uh, or .sg versus Lazada, for example. And they also have most of the time a higher price than the other platforms. And then you have a Q-commerce. Q-commerce is something that is not well defined yet, but that's something that, in my opinion, is going to um, be completely revolutionary in the future. So we're all talking about like liberalization for when it comes to public transportation and taxis. Yes, but now think about it. Um, about uh, a way to be delivered anything you need in less than twenty minutes by a fleet of driver that is just working twenty four seven. So what Foodpanda and Grab do, and you all know that because you've all been exposed to it during COVID, uh, is basically they created warehouses. And in, in these warehouses, you can have pretty much everything you would have on uh, Fortnite Red Mart, but moving forward more and more categories. And these can be delivered to your doorstep in 20 minutes because they don't have to hire anyone. So yes, the delivery is basically the, the, the main point of the Cucumus. For now, it's, uh, the issue is like it's very localized. You can do it because you're in Singapore. You can do it because you're maybe in Paris. Maybe you're, you're in London. But what happens in your, if you're in a bigger country? I don't know. Uh, and also, the price is going to be much higher, obviously, because uh, of the level of service and um, of uh, just the cost of delivery. So I don't know which kind of time I have. Uh, I might not be just being too much about the, the supply chain model. Um, so basically, uh, what I wanted to, um, to, to show here is not really how the supply chain is working because you all know that, but like it's just how the data is going to be collected by all the different uh, models. So this is the first thing we can model retail. I'm not going to talk about it. Um, when you take the marketplace um, supply chain model right now, you have a pool of supplier here. They deliver directly to your shopper. You don't need any sort of warehouses. You don't need any assets. You can just do a basic drop shipping thing and you won't have to pay any fee, you just collect the profit out of here. And you have data from the shoppers and you have data from the supply. So that's a very efficient model. Now, when you think about Amazon, Amazon has assets, they need warehouses. Um, they have a supplier delivering to the warehouses, to the warehouses delivering to you. And uh, then they can collect all the data from the suppliers, same as uh, Lazada shopping in the marketplace, but they have invest in assets. So uh, economically, it's a less efficient model. However, in terms of uh, excellency in supply chain and delivery, it's much more efficient. And when you have a cucumber model, it really depends. It uses a bit of both. And um, or they have a warehouse, or they just deliver from the shop directly. But in both cases, they don't have to pay for logistic, and they can offer you the service. So. Um, which model is going to eventually um, win. So if you, if you think about it, like for now, there is a, a model 
that is well established in the world and that is kind of getting into uh, Singapore right now and into Southeast Asia Pacific, but the Amazon model, because they're much more efficient when it comes to escalating things in the region. So now in Singapore, if you're interested in doing, there is a big war going on between uh, Redmart, which is a subsidiary of, uh, a subsidiary of uh, Lazada, and Amazon Prime now, which is basically doing exactly the same kind of, uh, of service, but more efficiently, just very a bit more pricey too. However, however, if the Qcommerce, um, if Foodpanda, if Deliveroo, if Grab, if Uber in, uh, in other countries achieves in having a wider assortment of products and a wider offer, uh, aren't they the best one to actually be the most efficient because they will be just faster cheaper with a wider assortment. And the issue that it uh, brings here is that basically, the bigger you are, the bigger you are. And it's not just uh, um, a, a way of joking, it's absolutely, uh, it's absolutely exponential because uh, the, the bigger your resources are, and you all know that the bigger, uh, the, bigger the amount of money you can invest in uh, just supply chain, in uh, influential organs, et cetera, et cetera, is going to be. And then you're going to be relying on the lower margin to make just by the volume a bigger profit. So the issue is that with, um, with uh, structures like Amazon, for example, with structures like uh, Grab or Penna, uh, you're going to move a little bit into more of an uh, oligopolistic structure versus a very diversified uh, pool of e-commerce actors. So there's a solution for this. Uh, obviously, there's public regulators. If you think about France, you have a, 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 a basically a, a whole governmental um, a part that is uh, applied to this, which is called uh, the antitrust regulation. However, um, take social commerce on, uh, on Facebook or on Instagram, for example. Do you want to forbid Instagram and Facebook to be in your country? Whereas, like, you know that everyone in your country is, is using it, it's a bit complicated. So, some people found a solution to basically these very, very big actors taking over the, um, uh, the small players. Uh, and I want just to talk a little bit about, uh, about the Australian example, because in Australia, people are actually educated and just talk to their uh, friends about it to um, uh, purchase local. So we can see it in the f and industry, for example, because uh, I don't know if you know a couple of brands, well, actually one brand of gin, uh, and I will just conclude with this, but it's called Four Pillars. Four Pillars was um, created not even 10 years ago. It's one of the biggest brands of gin right now. It's Australian, and it's been removing one after another all the other brands in Australia. People only drink this literal because people are exposed to versus local because they understand that by doing this, they will sustain their own economy. They will sustain like uh, basically the work of the people and their employment and eventually the growth of our country. So I personally think that's a good way to, uh, to go to uh, just uh, have a more diverse environment of, um, of economical factors. But uh, if you think differently, just let me know. And uh, I think I'm pretty good with this presentation. So uh, happy to have a chat with anyone that has any question or any comment or anything. Sorry, it's, it might have been a bit confusing at some times. Uh, I've been pretty fast on many things, sorry. No worries. Hey, Leo, um, sorry. Um, during the, the presentation, there was a little bit of a drop on the, in, the mic, uh, in, in the audio. So I'm oh. just making some questions. No worries at all, no worries at all. Okay. Um, so the, um, this question came just now. I didn't get all the details of the second part with the exchange rates. Uh, due to these differences, what's the link between this and e-commerce and Q-commerce? All right, uh, just going back on this. Uh, so we're speaking of, um, sorry, so the exchange rate or the, sorry, or the uh, taxation? Uh, exchange rate and then, and then the difference between e-commerce and Q-commerce. Okay, all right. Uh, so the exchange rate, basically, what I wanted to show you here is not really uh, directly linked to e-commerce or Q-commerce. It's just uh, one of the main challenges that we've been facing uh, at Rene Quantro and in the FNB, uh, general speaking, and also in luxury uh, during the COVID period. Because um, since the, e, the, the, the exchange rate has been like uh, just doing roller coasters during, uh, during the COVID period, actually, people 
have been able to purchase at a very low rate and resell to other markets, which has been increasing the parallel importation that we had in Singapore, but also in other countries. So uh, this is not directly linked to uh, the e-commerce or Q-commerce, but what you can see if you go online is that the best way for these people uh, that are doing parallel imports to uh, resell their products are actually online because it's less checked. So that would be basically uh, the, the answer I would have. I don't know if it's clear. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next one is a very simple one. Oh, what, is, uh, what is CBT? Oh, sorry. CBT is a cross-border traffic. It's uh, the parallel import, basically. Okay. All right. So this, this is an interesting question, okay? X as a luxury brand, do you think that it could affect the brand image to be on platforms such as Shopee or Lazada? And if so, how do you deal with this? Uh, well, that's, uh, that's a question that we're actually uh, having from our uh, headquarters in France right now. So um, it's, yeah, definitely, that's a problem. Um, the fact of being on this kind of brand, of, of platforms which are not definitely not fit for luxury is, um, is a way to um, fight the people that are here and selling our products, even if we don't want to. The issue with marketplaces is that anyone can sell. So if we don't do it, other people will do it. So that's right now a very big question we have because of course we don't want to be there. Of course we would like to be only on very, very high-end uh, um, uh, section and very high-end uh, uh, e-commerce websites. So I know for example, Amazon and Shopee are working on the luxury part of, the, of their marketplace. However, uh, for now, uh, if you don't do it, other people will with your products and resell your product at cheaper price and destroy your brand image and just you know uh, be all in place. So that's uh, an imperative, but that's obviously affecting the brand image. Okay, great. Next one. Uh, could you please share how are the e-commerce strategies in channel choice and channel development, marketplace or own e-commerce channel? Oh, um, complicated one. Uh, on our end, uh, what we think for now is that um, the e-commerce, just think about like, um, sorry, let me go back to, yeah, to this slide, yeah, for you. So um, think about like a full flow experience priority that people are looking at. There's two things, or you want to shop very quickly, and in that case, you want uh, to be delivered in one shopping uh, window. You're looking for in, instantaneity. And then you're going to go for, for example, Q-commerce, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, because it's not big things. Like you want, like, for example, I don't know, um, some soaked tomatoes, uh, a pack of beer, and, uh, and a couple of stuff. You don't need experience with this. You're, you want to be um, just have an experience. Um, sorry, you don't want experience. You want to be delivered right away, and you want it to take zero time. Uh, now, if you think of a very luxury product, uh, luxury product like we've been talking about Tres, but just think about like uh, you know luxury watches, luxury uh, jewelry, for example. You uh, want to spend time to understand what you're doing. So basically, you want to have an e-store. So that's what we're doing with Tres. We are creating e-boutique that people can actually spend time on, and they have a lot of content. Like there's you know videos, there are uh, 3D experiences. Uh, there's the possibility to um, to uh, if you purchase the Kanto Pinterest, for example, you're going to have a code and then you have access to a lot of things online, a lot of content that is absolutely exclusive. However, uh, if you think of the portfolio of um, any uh, big um, uh, FNB actor like uh, ourselves plus Campari or like DGO, like uh, LVMH, like MHD, for example, um, people are not going to go just on one website to purchase a bottle of the botanist gin, for example. They can have it on on a retail shop and they will just um, basically do uh, as so. so we don't want to invest time or money into something that is not going to be experiential uh, because we think that uh, people are all looking for a one-stop store so you go in red Mart, you do your all grocery stores and that's it uh, you don't want to go to a uh, i don't know um, fruits and vegetable e-store and then a liquor store and then a beast store you want to have like only one channel because it just saves time or you want to leave an experience and in that case yes you need an e-boutique but that's a bit um 
well, that's tough to do. I mean, uh, because you need to create just content. It's not just to sell a product online, to create an experience online. So that's also uh, a very big challenge for everyone right now, just to uh, uh, try to understand how to create something different online. That is not just selling a product. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, do you have many problems with counterfeit products? Does online sales make it worse? Yes and yes. Um, so counterfeit products are a very good thing because uh, as soon as you are getting uh, you know, uh, a knockoff and you have counterfeit product, that means that your brand is actually doing very well because everyone wants it. Um, we have a bit, it's very hard to identify and it's basically only for uh, the brand we've been talking about, which is Utrez. And yes, e-commerce makes it absolutely worse. And more than e-commerce, uh, the parallel import makes it worse because basically you have stock. What we do for our products um, in any market, we control them. We know exactly who can sell them. We can we have a full traceability on it. But when it comes from, let's say, um, I don't know, like from Australia or from the United States into Singapore, and we don't control it because it's been imported by a parallel import, uh, we can't control this. So we can't just um, basically check the quality. So yes, we had a lot of returns of many people saying, yeah, this is absolutely disgusting uh, or just, uh, you know, even like if the packaging is destroyed in some way, the brand is hurt and the brand image is hurt and people call us saying, hey, there's an issue with my product. And we're like, oh, we're sorry, but we didn't sell it to you actually, but you can't really tell that to your consumer because we're still drinking your product. So that's a bit of a tricky problem. Yes, it makes it definitely worse. Okay, interesting one. LV made an agreement with Taobao to avoid counterfeit, do you envisage doing similar things or is it out of the budget? Sorry, can you say that again, Will? Uh, LV made an agreement with Taobao to avoid counterfeits. Do you envisage uh, doing similar thing or is it out of the budget? We did it with JD actually, uh, and it's only in China for now. So um, we're going to see what's happening with JD actually. It's an interesting question. Uh, so yes, they, they, they uh, actually monitor very well what they're doing with the counterparts. And uh, we might do it with the Zara in Singapore. That's uh, a conversation we have, but that's not happening before a year or two. Um, and there's conversations of JD maybe trying to acquire Shopee at some point. So maybe it could be extended to, uh, to another, um, to, um, to this other retailer, but uh, for now, nothing in Singapore, nothing in Seattle, just in China, yes. Okay, pretty long question I have here, okay? Hang with me. Uh, my question is, there is a decline in alcohol consumption among young people. Studies show that the millennial generation and the Gen Z customers are drinking less often and are more conscious about health and wellness. Is it something that you're observing too? What is the situation in Asia and how are you preparing for the future? That's, that's, that's probably three questions right there. Yeah. Um, so no, we're not really observing it. Uh, there is, so yes and no. Yes, that's something we're um, actually afraid of um, for Remy Martin. So as I told in the beginning, uh, Remy Martin is actually a very non-differentiated brand uh, because we only have one product only in a couple of markets. And we can see that um, basically what happens if tomorrow everyone in China says that, uh, oh, I want to drink whiskey instead of cognac, or I want to drink uh, uh, basically soft drinks instead of cognac, we're dead. So just the company's dead instantly. Uh, so yeah, that's something we're fearing. However, what we work on uh, within Remy Quattro is to uh, forecast this trend of people uh, trying to consume better. So the product we're doing are a bit out of a class uh, that you would have, for example, if you're purchasing like a beef eater gin, Gibson gin, or like Chivas uh, whiskey, or this kind of things. We'll try to be positioned higher. And by being positioned higher, we'll also ensure our consumer and our clients that the quality is better, the production methods are better, and that we're also having a sustainable um, footprint, not just in terms of uh, carbon footprint, footprint, but also in terms of employment everywhere. And that's actually a message that we communicate down to our consumer and that is very well received. Now, when you're thinking about health uh, issues, once again, uh, there's 
two ways of drinking alcohol. There is my way of drinking alcohol and to get completely drunk and fucked up. And there's uh, another way of drinking alcohol, which is to actually appreciate uh, what you're drinking. What we provide in terms of products is more of this. We try to uh, do more experiential things. We try to uh, work very closely with like very high end cocktail bars to create basically something that is not just being drunk, it's having an experience. It's just like having a fine dining experience. Um, we want to have this within the beverage industry. However, uh, the trend is existing. And, uh, and there have been conversations of uh, maybe uh, uh, creating a range of products that is non-alcoholic. I think that so far it won't happen. And uh, to be honest, I think it will never happen within this company or not in the next decade at least. But yes, uh, that's, that's uh, something that we need to be thinking about. Uh, however, once again, the positioning that we have uh, allows us to be a bit above this issue. Okay. Thank you. Uh, going back to the question before that one, okay. Uh, someone asked, why JD and not Taobao? What is the selection standard? I don't know, it's just, it, it's, it's just relation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's literally just relation. It's that uh, I, I think uh, someone at, uh, at uh, Remy China, or maybe the CEO or CFO, um, know the guys at, uh, at JD and so they, they achieved to have this, uh, this conversation. Uh, maybe they will succeed to do it on Taobao, maybe on Alibaba, but um, uh, Maybe it's they're doing it right now, but I just I'm, I just know that it's a, it's a, it's a relation thing. Just like the conversation we're having with Lazada right now, it's absolutely a conversation. Uh, sorry, a relation thing. Okay, very quickly, last two questions, okay, because of time. Yeah. Um, do you have a specific team internally to manage the e-commerce stores in China, uh, or are you working with a third party, and why? No, in uh, in China or in Singapore? Uh, China. No, no, in China we have an internal team. Uh, they're also teaming up with. Um, we could call a couple of other dudes, especially when it comes to uh, digital marketing. So they're using agency for uh, for uh, digital marketing, but there's like a team of like 10 people uh, doing e-commerce in China. And uh, they're actually, uh, these 10 people are carrying, I think uh, something something like 15% of the whole revenue of the company worldwide. So, you know, good job to them. Okay, great. Last one. Um, during the digital world, Okay, would you consider offline boutique as well? And how do you balance the relationship between online and offline? Sorry, the uh, digital. Okay, in the digital world, would you consider offline boutique as well? And how do you balance the relationship between online and offline? They, they are actors of uh, the the e-commerce and e-tail uh, landscape because. They can be on Amazon, they can be on uh, Zara, they can be on a food panda, Q-commerce, or like Panda Market, for example, Q-commerce channel. So they are online. Anyone offline is not online if they want to, that's, that's not so hard. So yes, they are part of it. Uh, how to differentiate them is um, sometimes a bit tricky because we don't really know who's been doing sales online or offline. Uh, but yeah, they're obviously a big part of it. Um, sorry, what was the end of the question? Um, how, how do you balance the relationship between the online and offline? Ah, oh, yes, okay. Uh, I see what I mean. Um, I don't know. No, no, that's a very good question. It's um, it's a very good question. I think everyone, even in the offline world, so basically the guys at Consorated, right, right, they, they, they know really well um, that we need to extend on e-commerce and they are also working on their own e-commerce platform. So the best we can do is to have consistent and relevant pricing for everyone and that we apply the same strategy and the same benefits for everyone because if we start having different uh, uh, retail prices, then people are going to think that uh, we're just giving better prices to uh, people at Stratus right, right, and stop working with us. So that's uh, just managing the relation, but that's not very different than uh, managing the relations between different on-trade outlets, for example, or uh, even between different uh, retailers. But yes, that's uh, additional people on the market uh, for sure. However, it's uh, the, the, the way we deal with it is the same that we've been dealing with uh, all the actors, basically. All right, thank you. Leo, I just want to squeeze one more in, okay? Just one more question, okay? If you don't mind. Yeah, no worries. Uh, there was actually a social brand of drinking solo in South Korea. Have you heard of it? Well, would it be potentially uh, an opportunity for your brand? Drinking solo? Yeah. All right. Uh... Social trend. I didn't hear about it in Korea, but uh, I, I know people have been um, uh, doing here during the lockdown, especially uh, 
uh, a lot of um, sort of bar uh, online, uh, like a happy hour online. So I know it has been happening, but also it has been happening within the industry. Uh, so maybe I'm, I'm not aware of what has been happening in Singapore uh, overall. But no, definitely didn't hear about it, but that's a very good idea. We should do it more. <laughs> okay. All right. So my friend, thank you. That was the last question. Yeah. And that's good. Thank you so much. Um, folks, if you have any other questions, you know, please send them to me, email it to me, and then I will forward it to, you know, a Leo and a Leo can then type in the answers, etc. You know, um, if there's nothing, Leo, once again, thank you very much for dropping in and then sharing you. your info. And uh, folks, let's all just wave at the screen and all thank you, Leo, and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, guys. Take care, be safe. Thank you, Leo. Cheers. All Cheers. Together. Thank you. Thank you, guys. See you. Thank you.